thank all of you for being here this evening. We're delighted that you're able to join us for this discussion. Uh, I'd like to say on a personal note, what a pleasure it always is for Texas Monthly to have the opportunity to partner with the Baker Institute, not only in terms of providing a terrific venue like this, uh, as they have so many times in the past. I believe that our first, one of the first panels that I worked on with you was back in 2009 when we did the Life After Ike panel, and Mayor Bill White was here along with another a terrific panel. So thank you for that. And I'd also like to thank the panelists for being here to discuss this very serious topic. Uh, I'll just go down the line, uh, as, as the ambassador had said. Sitting to my left is Dr. William Martin. Bill, as I know him, Bill has been a longtime contributor to Texas Monthly. I'm not even sure the first time you and I worked together, but it's been a, it's been a long time. Uh, perhaps more importantly, as the director of drug policy here at the Baker Institute, we're delighted that he's here. And as we had said, that part of the genesis of this panel was the story that Bill and I had worked on for the June issue. Uh, only slightly less talked about than the cover subject, George Strait, it seems to me. Uh, I'm glad that you're here, Bill. Uh, sitting beside him is Senator Joan Huffman from Houston. Uh, in the previous session, Senator Huffman served as the vice chair of the Criminal Justice Committee and is also the caucus chair for the Republicans uh, in the Senate. We're delighted to have her here. Uh, sitting to her le left is Dr. Neeraj Shaw, who is a physician at Seton Medical Center in Austin uh, and a specialist in PTSD. Uh, and pleased to have him here to offer the medical perspective. And then sitting at the end of the panel is retired Major Dave Bass, who served in the US Army for 21 years, including multiple tours in Iraq, uh, and was one of the uh, individuals featured in uh, Bill's story. So welcome to you and welcome to our panelists. Thank you for, for, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, Bill, I, it, it makes sense, I think, to start with you just because this was a story that you and I had been talking about for some time. Uh, in the context of your role here at the Baker Institute, but then certainly as a journalist, I wonder if you could just begin to share with us to start us off uh, what brought you to this topic and how did you begin to think of it as an article, not only for your academic studies, but for, for the magazine? Sure. Well, I've had a long interest in, in drug policy and drug policy issues. Before retiring, I was a, in the sociology department here at Rice for 38 years. And for 35 of those years, I taught criminology. And for a number of the years, I taught American social problems. So naturally, drugs en enter into that. Um, so over, the, over that time, I was very much interested in that and came to Ambassador Jurigen about uh, 12 or 13 years ago and said, we need to have, we, how would you feel about an, a, a program of looking at U.S. drug policy? And I will not forget his, well, I may, I forget a lot of things I didn't intend to. <laughs> but uh, I have not yet forgotten what he said. He said, well, uh, eradication, interdiction, and incarceration don't work. That's a very good start. Those are the three pillars of U.S. drug policy. And uh, I, so we have moved with, uh, fr from there, uh, I think, very fruitfully. Uh, drugs, obviously, ex explicitly including alcohol, can cause uh, enormous harm. They can ruin lives, they can mess up communities, they can undercut the, the, the uh, practice of democracy. And the, but many of the problems that arise that we, we talk about as being drug problems are actually related to our drug policies rather than to the, the drugs themselves. That's not to say that we don't have a drug abuse problem. We do, but prohibition the war on drugs is, is not the answer. It's premised on incorrect assumptions, it aims at the wrong targets, and it, I think it causes more problems than it cures. So without hyperbole, or I mean it to be without hyperbole, I think it is one of our, our policy is one of our most serious social problems. Uh, so I have been interested in this and writing about it and saying we, this is, we, we really need to address this openly. I don't have a personal stake in this, I should say. I don't. I'm, I'm, I talked about in, in the magazine in a piece I wrote in 2009 called Texas Highways. I didn't think of the title, but it's a wonderful title. The magazine editors. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that, uh, that I said, I, I used marijuana five or six times in the early 70s, depending on whether you count the one time at Willie Nelson's house, I did not inhale. <laughs> so, because I was on a road and a long way and I didn't want to be unsafe. And the other times it burned my throat and reduced my small a uh, cache of charisma even more. <laughs> so I, I was, did not think it would make me more creative. But, um, and I have not, my children and grandchildren have not had any problems with this. My interest in this as much as anything is a long-standing opposition to irrational, ineffective, harmful public policy. Um, 
last year in, in the, at the, at the 2013 legislative uh, sessions, I listened online to a committee hearing. It was a long committee hearing. It lasted about four hours. And uh, several people here tonight were, were there. But two of, the, two of the speakers were Dave Bass, Major Bass, who talked about how marijuana had helped him deal with his PTSD. And another one of the speakers was Dr. Neera Shah, and uh, he talked about how he had, like Sanjay Gupta, had turned from being opposed to, to marijuana to, to studying it and thinking it had many, many positive benefits. And I thought, PTSD, veterans, this could be a good story, and you know how, how we do. We think this is, a, this is a good idea for a story and would build on the work that I was already doing with respect to trying to alter our laws. So, through that, I got in touch with Dave Shaw and began and built a list of veterans to talk to. And some are here tonight, and others who are not here tonight and are listening in other places. I want to express my admiration and gratitude for their being so open to talking with me about that. 2.3 million servicemen and women served in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's a higher number than many people realize. In Texas, we have about 1.6 million, nearly 1.6 million veterans. Half a million of those were in Iraq and or Afghanistan. Another little more than half a million served in, in, in Vietnam. In addition to telling their stories, I didn't interview all, of course, but in addition to telling their stories about war, which can be horrifying, and the PTSD that they suffered, nearly everyone I talked to talked about seriously considering suicide. You learn earlier this, this year, there was a paper came out and a lot of attention came to it that there are 22 veterans commit suicide every day, one about every 65 minutes. What was not said, the authors said this probably undercounts. States with 60% of the veterans did not submit their information in time, including Texas, to be involved in that so that the numbers could easily be twice that. Uh, veterans uh, also talked to me about being pilled up zombies uh, uh, from antidepressants, from opioid painkillers, from sleeping pills. And as one put it, they were handed out like Skittles by VA doctors. And of course, that, they, they found relief in marijuana, which was not for them a gateway to other drugs, but an exit drug from alcohol and, and uh, prescription drugs. We have, and Dr. Shaw will talk about this, I'm sure, we have an endocannabinoid system in our bodies, which briefly is we make cannabis and we use it. And when we run short or it gets overwhelmed, external help, ex external uh, cannabis can, can help bring things back into balance. Most Americans, 77% 70, of Texans, and believe that medical marijuana should be available for therapeutic purposes. More than half favor legalization for recreational purposes. Now, there are several different alternative regimes, each one of them with some downsides. And no one believes that if we legalize marijuana, there won't be some, some downsides, notably some, at least some rise in use and abuse. But the call for change, fortunately, is, is bipartisan. A lot of the problems were bipartisan of the policy. Ronald Reagan and, and Bill Clinton are sort of equally culpable for ramping up the war on drugs. But the late uh, Milton Friedman and William F. Buckley Jr. and Walter Cronkite were all for changing, changing our laws. The Koch brothers and George Soros, uh, the Cato Institute, the Hoover Institution, as well as the Baker Institute, the ACLU and Republicans against uh, mar mar marijuana pro uh, prohibition, uh, George Shultz and Paul Volcker, the Nation and the Wall Street Journal and The Economist, Grover Norquist and Richard Branson, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, Rand Paul, maybe Ted Cruz. Uh, at least some, perhaps a number of significant politicians favor change but are fear being primary. Uh, legislators are often more likely to be followers than leaders and they need to be pushed. And now veterans are deciding that they need to push for for this kind of change. And a, a movement is, is building. You, may, uh, Ambassador, mentioned that uh, we are joined together with the South Texas College of Law, Professor Drury Stevenson, who is also a non-resident fellow, and uh, 
and Raymond Balesha, who is seated with uh, my postdoc or our postdoc, Nate Jones, work very much on these uh, model legislation for Texas, which will be on our website soon. And um, should also, we, Ambassador left out Dean Mac Becker here, who is a non-resident research associate and uh, does a great job with his, he actually has a book called To End the War on Drugs, A Guide for Politicians, the Press, and Public, which is based on more than 100 uh, interviews that he has done over the, over the years. 22 states in the District of Columbia have, and that two, it's two states more than when the article was published already, have legalized oh, medical Arizona, marijuana. Right. And three or four more are likely to, to do that. It's the right thing to do, and uh, I'm for it. Okay, well, that's, that, so that, that, that's a lot of ground to cover. I appreciate that, Bill. And so let me, in terms of dialing this in very specifically, one of the things that I wanted to make sure is that we all sort of have a sense of what are the issues that we are talking about through the lens of this particular article as it is manifested in veterans through PTSD and then the treatment options that are available to them, particularly given the kind of the unprecedented deployments that we have seen after 9-11. And I think that's the thing that we have been struggling with as a culture. Texas is a military state. And so I might... Uh, if it's okay, jump down to Dr. Shaw, because I think, Dr. Shaw, could you help us just get a sense from a clinical standpoint, when we talk about something like PTSD, what are we really talking about and its effects on veterans? When we're talking about treatment options, again, both traditional and perhaps non-traditional, maybe just set the stage as we begin to continue the conversation about what is it that we are actually dealing with here? Okay, should I just do the slide? Please, Please yes. Okay. Um, I prepared a couple of slides. Um, I, I'll give you an idea about uh, also my practice and what kind of physician I am. Uh, he mentioned that I was an expert on PTSD. I don't, I don't think in the medical community I'd be considered an expert on PTSD, but, but I am an emergency physician. So my background is in internal medicine, and I did my residency in that. And currently I work both in the ER, the hospital and uh, the ICU, the Seton Hospital in Austin. Uh, prior to that, I actually had a long career at the VA and I had worked at the VA emergency room in Dallas and also in Temple and in Houston. And I've seen, and, and I think that's kind of where the expertise and my exposure to PTSD and kind of my willingness to talk about this topic uh, comes from. And kind of with that as my background, I had a couple of slides. I'll try to go through them quickly and just give you, um, you know, without being too medical and jargony, give you a, a quick background um, to the clinical part of this. And so, you know, PTSD, just the abbreviation is post-traumatic stress disorder. The different types of trauma, um, the two most common are military combat and uh, sexual assault or sexual abuse, uh, especially in females in their, in their youth. Um, other ones are, you know, natural disasters, motor vehicle accidents. Um, we, we talked about sexual assault, rape, and incest, and that includes uh, childhood sexual abuse. Um, you could also have a sudden diagnosis of a life-threatening illness, a severe physical injury, um, or even time spent in the ICU. And this could be enough of a significant trauma, depending on how severe the episode was, uh, to cause the, the syndrome of PTSD. And that's defined as, and this is using the DSM-4 criteria, and that's basically the psychiatric Bible for diagnoses in, in mental health. So it's a complex somatic, cognitive, affective, and behavioral uh, disorder. And so that basically means it affects uh, your sensory system, your thought process, your mood, and also uh, the way you behave. Um, prevalence is about 10% here in the United States, and if you take subpopulations such as veterans, um, you know, it's much higher. Uh, it's usually characterized by intrusive thoughts, uh, nightmares and flashbacks, and you have uh, reliving of the past traumatic events. Often you can have something um, called dissociation. It's where it's almost kind of an out-of-body experience and you're not in the, the current, kind of the current setting. And, you know, people even talking to you um, can't get through to you. And sometimes you're thrashing around on the ground, having your flashbacks, um, hypervigilant, sleep disturbances. And all of this, you know, you can imagine having a severe traumatic exposure, experiencing this, these symptoms. And it, it definitely rubs off on uh, patient social lives, uh, occupational lives, and interpersonal lives. 
they're not able to work, they're disabled. Um, you know, a lot of them end up isolated and, you know, without friends or a partner. And that's, I believe, you know, one of the big reasons why the rate of suicide is so high. In terms of assessing the severity, there are two scales that are used in uh, the mental health community and also in the research studies. One is called the CAPS, and this is one where the doctor asks you questions about, about the severity of different symptoms. And the other one that's actually, I think, more useful is um, the PCL or the, the patient checklist where they go through and you'll see on the left hand side there are questions you rate one through five, five being you know ex, uh, extremely symptomatic and it asks questions like have you lost interest in your activities, are you feeling distant from other people, so on and so forth. So if you add up five times 17, I think it's about 95 is the top score. Anything over 50 is considered moderately severe and then the closer you get you know up to the 80s and 90s is very severe. The higher the score, the higher the risk for suicide, obviously. Uh, other things that tend to happen, you know, uh, patients that have the, carry the diagnosis of PTSD are, are usually two to four times more likely to develop depression, anxiety, and the big problem is substance abuse. So they turn to self-medicating with alcohol. Um, they usually have, uh, as Dr. Martin mentioned, you know, Skittles at home. So they have bottles and bottles of pills and usually enough to uh, commit a pretty easily successful suicide attempt. Um, so that, that's actually a big concern of, of, of mine and of the medical community is coming up with safer options for uh, patients to reach for if they are in that severe acute phase and they're reaching for alcohol and pills to alleviate their symptoms. Um, current therapies are only partially effective. In terms of medication therapy, usually the first line agents are what they use for uh, depression and generalized anxiety disorder, which are the SSRIs or the serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And then the, usually those have limited effectivity and then you graduate to um, second line agents, which are usually atypical antipsychotics used in schizophrenia. And most of those medications have pretty bad side effects, weight gain and uh, developing diabetes diabetes and the list goes on and on. Um, so not, not very safe options. And most of the time patients are on, you know, often both medications and have gone through therapy and are still refractory to pretty much full conventional therapy. Um, to give you an idea of how effective conventional therapy is so far, uh, PTSD, only a third of the patients report recovery or recover, recovering at one year. If you look 10 years down the road, a third of the patients are still symptomatic and many of them, you know, moderate to severe. And so everybody else takes between a year and 10 years to move in the right direction to get well. Um, they have poor outcomes, like, like I mentioned, difficulty with job, friends, family. Um, the part of the brain that I'm showing you here is the limbic system, and that's basically responsible for our emotional uh, health and regulating emotions, including fear, uh, anxiety, and also positive emotions, happiness, and uh, fulfillment. And there are marijuana receptors or uh, cannabis receptors throughout this si system, and Dr. Martin started um, kind of describing the basics. And so, so quick foundation is that there are receptors for both marijuana, the plant that grows outside of your body, but then also within your own body, there are what they call endocannabinoid receptors. And cannabinoid is just the word for cannabis that the body makes, and endo is within. So everybody's heard of kind of the natural high and endorphins when you're running a race. Um, there, there are similar, similar chemicals that bind to endocannabinoid receptors, and within the body, one, one example is anandamide. That's the chemical um, that's secreted, and it's the body's own, essentially, cannabis or marijuana. Um, nature, luckily, has also produced um, multiple varieties or what they call strains of marijuana. Some of the words they use to describe them are sativa or indica. And recently, uh, due to more scientific research, they've actually elucidated um, the, the pharmacology of this system. So they know that uh, that the cannabis molecules that come from the plants are basically falling into three categories. One is THC. That one binds mostly in the brain and kind of gives you the high. Another one is called CBD, and a third one is CBN. And all three of these bind to these endocannabinoid receptors if you either smoke them, eat them, vaporize them, and whatever form you choose to ingest them in. And they have effects downstream. 
Um, just some quick studies uh, that showed some positive results uh, for cannabis treating uh, nightmares. This was a Canadian study done at a Canadian Armed Forces uh, health base, and they used a synthetic cannabinoid. So this is uh, nabilone, and they took 80 pa about 80 patients and studied the effects of using this on, and, and these patients were resistant to uh, first and second line therapy, uh, and 72% experienced cessation or reduction in the intensity of their nightmares. So this was a pretty positive study uh, coming from Canada. Another uh, thing I wanted to share quickly is I had a patient of my own that I had seen and kind of kept up with, and she had PTSD from sexual assault. And if you look at the numbers down in blue, this is her PCL scale. And remember, this is the, the scale of assessing how severe her symptoms were. When I met her in December of 2012, and those are the circles that are made in blue, uh, her, her total score on the PCL was 82. Uh, she was suicidal. Uh, she was on probably at least 10 different pharmaceuticals, and she self-reported to me that she was interested in using cannabis, and I said, you know, if that was the only medication she was going to use, then, you know, I would allow her to, to keep seeing me and stay in my panel, but, um, you know, she'd have to be responsible with it. Well, within about two years, I, last month I just saw her in a follow-up, and her score dropped from an 82 to a 32. And I asked her what she thought her dramatic improvement, you know, was from, and she said, you know, if I hadn't used the cannabis, I don't think I'd be here talking to you right now. So I've seen, you know, some patients have some pretty dramatic positive results with this, and she is probably off, I would say, two-thirds of her medications, and her goal is to be pretty much completely off meds, and I'm, I was pretty proud of her. <laughs> um, there's also a pilot study that was done in Israel. Uh, as you know, the, their military, um, you know, they have required military service, so the rates of PTSD are very high there, and there's... There are a couple of physicians that are actually doing the groundbreaking research out in, in, in Israel, and they conducted this study. Um, it was a small study. It was just a pilot study of 30 uh, veterans. And, excuse me. Um, basically, uh, the results were about a 75% improvement in symptomatology and uh, the CAP scores here. When they started uh, this study, people were rating as high as about 97 at their baseline cap score. And then the f they did assessments along the way. And the fourth score at the bottom is about half of the original, which is still moderately severe. But again, you know, displays a, a pretty significant uh, improvement in symptoms using the cap score. And that was attributed to medical cannabis. Um, obviously, future research is needed. Uh, research in this country is a little bit limited, or uh, a lot bit limited, <laughs> because of the scheduling and the DEA's policy and the federal government's policy. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are asking, where is the research? But then they also need to be asking why the research is not there. Um, I think we have a long way to go uh, on our policy, too. There are a lot of other studies and, and points, but I just wanted to keep this limited to uh, what I mentioned. Thank you. Dr. Shaw, I want to—I I, I do want to move on to this point because I, I certainly want to get to Major Bass and Senator Huffman. But let me just ask you a, a, a quick question, please. Yes. Um, when you referred to the, the the female patient that you had treated that had the dramatic change in the in the scores for mm -hmm. risk of suicide, is there not a concern t to you as a medical doctor? Is she not at a certain point then? self-medicating and then regulating her own treatment options as a doctor? Is that, first of all, am I correct in saying that? But then as a doctor, is that something that you're comfortable signing off on? Um, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, she was actually, she was under the care of a, of a primary care physician, a psychiatrist, and then um, also was seeing me for some various issues. I'd seen her in the hospital too. And um, with cannabis, you know, there, there, there are a couple of issues. So there, it, it, it does have side effects. It is psychoactive. And the preference is to take it, you know, in, for example, if you were in a state that had a medical marijuana program, you would have the freedom and the luxury to take it under the direction of a physician. But the policy in Texas and the way that the laws are now, there are almost no physicians in Texas that right. would treat you and guide you in, because honestly, we, they just don't know the science. They don't know how many milligrams to recommend. 
Um, so a lot of it does end up becoming an experiment, not an experiment, but basically uh, self-titration, I would say, of that medication. And the, the reason I don't have a problem is because the exceptional safety profile. There, there, I, there are no overdoses or deaths attributable to marijuana. So I know at least she's dealing with a substance that's safe. And I think because, you know, if, if you still agree to monitor their patient and you're not necessarily managing the, the cannabis use specifically, you can just tell by the way um, the patient's symptoms are improving, either based on the CAP score, honestly, just by looking at them, uh, talking to them, asking certain questions. Okay. Um, so I, I think there still is, you're, you're monitoring the patient, but you're not necessarily um, you know, at least in Texas, we don't we don't have that luxury to. I, no, I, I understand. And, and there is science, and there is uh, there are cannabis experts in in states like Colorado, California, um, places where they've had medical cannabis for a while, and they have NIH grants, and there are you know some people doing serious science with it that could make those recommendations. It's just harder for physicians in Texas. Major Bass, you had served in the U.S. Army for 21 years, and as I said, in, including multiple tours in Iraq. Uh, I, I wonder the degree to which some of this information sounds very familiar to you or, or is similar to your story, not only being overseas and serving, but then the, the, the trauma of coming back and then readjusting to life in the States. I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about your history and how it, the, what we've heard from Dr. Martin and Dr. Shaw, how that relates to your personal experience. Um, I served one tour in Iraq, not, not multiple. Um, in 0405 with the uh, 1st Cavalry Division in uh, Baghdad. Um, I had served in another combat operation, Desert Storm, uh, in 1991. And um, I served in Desert Storm. I commanded a, a maintenance company, and I was at Logistics ba Base Echo, uh, way out in the desert of Saudi Arabia. And uh, then uh, after the combat operations were over, we moved back to King Khaled Military City. And when I came back from Desert Storm, it was very normal um, redeployment back and decompression. And then I carried on my normal life after Desert Storm and it was no big deal. Uh, when I came back from Iraq, uh, it was totally different. I expected that it would be like Desert Storm. It would take me a few weeks, a couple of months to kind of adjust and get back into the rhythm of a normal life and then uh, everything would be exactly the same. But when I came back from Iraq, it was totally different because my experiences in Iraq were totally different. In, in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, my company, we weren't under fire and, and people weren't dying around us. Uh, in Iraq, uh, as you read in the article, you, you saw what I experienced. And so when I came back from Iraq, um, it, it wasn't a, a simple process of just uh, decompressing for a couple of months then carrying on my normal life. In fact, uh, things were totally out of control and I was, I was really confused about that uh, because I had expected it would be exactly like coming back from Desert Storm and I couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, and so uh, the symptoms I had were the exact symptoms that Dr. Shaw uh, showed on the, on the slide. And, um, and uh, I was uh, really hard to live with, obviously, uh, for my uh, army wife. And uh, I was getting ready to retire. I decided to retire. And, uh, and so I really felt like I could not go out into the civilian world with these symptoms. I couldn't function. Um, and if, uh, the, kind of the scary thing is, if I hadn't been getting ready to retire, I wouldn't have taken any action. The only reason I went and checked myself into the mental health clinic is because I was getting ready to retire. Uh, many, many soldiers will not uh, go seek uh, treatment for PTSD because they're still on active duty and they perceive rightly uh, that that will affect their career. And so there's lots of soldiers still serving with symptoms of PTSD and they're not getting treatment for that. Uh, because it's a stigma still in the military, even though the military is trying to make it not a stigma, it is. Um, and so I went to the mental health clinic uh, because I had those symptoms, and I went through the exact same assessment that Dr. Shaw showed in the slide. And uh, the psychiatrist at the, uh, at the uh, mental health clinic at Fort Hood uh, said, you have PTSD. These are the symptoms of PTSD. And, and I was shocked because it, it never occurred to me 
uh, that I would be the type of person who would get PTSD because I'm a tough guy, you know, and that don't happen to us tough guys. Uh, and so uh, they uh, immediately uh, put me into a therapy program, and that was very useful, uh, cognitive therapy program with a psychologist, and gave me uh, psychotropic drugs, which were absolutely horrible, uh, just awful side effects, and, um, and uh, I, I really hated them. And so then I went through, uh, I was getting ready to retire, so I went through the same assessment at the VA hospital with a psychiatrist at uh, Temple, Texas. And uh, his diagnosis was the exact same diagnosis as the medical doctor at Fort Hood. He said, okay, you have PTSD and here's your disability, uh, good luck. And, uh, and so I just switched getting my drugs from uh, the hospital at Fort Hood to getting my drugs at the hospital at uh, the Temple VA. And they give you a lot of drugs, uh, a lot, lot more than, than I think uh, we, we should get. And I was also getting uh, pain meds because uh, uh, I have a disability for some injuries I suffered in the military and so I have chronic pain and so I was getting psychotropic drugs and pain meds. And then anybody who served in the military knows that the military is a drinking culture. It's an alcohol culture. And so um, I was carrying on my drinking, just like uh, we do in the military, and uh, taking the psychotropic drugs and the, uh, the, the pain meds. And that is not a good combination. That is not the way to uh, live your life. And so um, the bottom line is for me, uh, when I uh, discovered cannabis, uh, cannabis was not a gateway drug. I was already addicted to drugs, legal drugs, uh, that the VA was giving me. And, uh, and uh, cannabis was, uh, was um, an exit drug for me. And uh, it saved me. Thank you, Major. Uh, Senator, I wonder if I could ask you, as we sort of begin to process all of this information, could you just help us get a sense right now of where do you think, what are you hearing from your constituents? What are their concerns about this issue? And then just what is the general talk at, at the legislature? Uh, Dr. Martin had talked about some committee hearings in, in 2013. As most of you know, we'll be starting a new legislative session in January of 2015. I wonder if you could just sort of give us a broader view of what it might look like in the Capitol and what you're hearing from your constituents. Sure, and I, you know, I could start out by saying that clearly the stories from the veterans are, are very compelling. And um, I think what what's going on nationally and a, a lot of disgust about how the veterans have been treated, I think certainly in the state we want to do what we can to assist veterans in any way that that we possibly can to help facilitate their coming back into society and to living normal lives that being said um, you know how does this fit into drug policy in Texas and current state law and what's on the horizon for changing that law and I think that's probably the more um, difficult question. Um, it was said earlier that it, this is not um, a partisan issue, and you are completely correct on that, because I certainly hear from, um, I'm, I'm a Republican, I certainly hear from some of my more conservative Republican activists, and I see I have some here in the audience, and I bet you'll hear from them. I hear from them a lot, and they're very supportive of um, decriminalization of drugs, and I've talked to them at length, read books that they've sent me and so forth. But um, you, will, you find people on both sides of the issue, on both sides of the aisle. Um, as we know, Texas is a, is a big state. It's five times larger than Colorado, and our issues here are different than issues in Colorado. Uh, we fought the drug war on the border, and that's part of our culture as well. Um, and so, it, and we're Texas. We think a little different than some of the other states, um, and we have different opinions. So from what I see and what I'm hearing, sure, we are, we're hearing both sides of the issue. I don't think, from my discussion with leadership and with others who would be in positions for big changes to happen on the horizon, that anything's going to happen anytime soon. Um, again, the, the, the story of the veterans is compelling. but. If we looked at, look at this from a, a practical situation, 
I would look at it, well, okay, well, how would we work it so the veterans could get what they needed, the drugs that the doctors decide that they need? That, that is really what they need, and we find a way that we can prescribe it in a legal way, and they get what they need. What happens is we look at other states where some of the medical marijuana is really a farce, and we they set up these doc shops, you know, along the side of the road where people, you know, one stop they get a prescription, and right next door is the smoke shop. Um, we don't want that in Texas. I I think I can speak for uh, a lot of people that say we don't want that culture, and we certainly don't want a culture where our children are exposed to marijuana. I understand there's some benefits we get it, but I think there's also a lot of good science, recent science, that it has made it clear that marijuana is dangerous to a developing brain in teenagers. I believe we could all agree on that, and that's come from, you know, credible studies. And, you know, we haven't been so good about keeping alcohol away from teenagers, and I sort of believe that we're not going to be successful about um, keeping marijuana away from our teenagers. That's a major concern of mine. So as we try to fit all these issues, uh, work them out, I do think that we will have discussions. That's a good thing. Um, I think we will discuss uh, where we want to go in Texas. I think we should watch the states that are experimenting with this, like Colorado. Um, you know, I think the governor of Colorado has recently said he would encourage states not to follow their course and to pay attention for a few years and see right. how it works in Colorado. People in Colorado, you know, it's it's a different state, as I've said, and and. Um, you know, I've heard people say, well, well, we'll go to the farmers and say, you know, this will turn around the economy. Trust me, I haven't seen the Texas Farm Bureau coming and saying, Senator, you know, my, my guys want to grow weed out in their fields. You know, I don't see that happening with Texas farmers anytime soon, but people change and cultures change and societies change, and so that could happen. I think we have to stay informed. I think it's wonderful to have a discussion like this. And, you know, I would hope that the feds would um, allow more research in this area, you know, release the marijuana so that some high level studies can be conducted and see if we have good research. If we have good positive research from credible sources, then maybe there's a way to craft legislation that is for veterans right. and that right. is specifically for them. I would be very open to looking at very controlled legislation um, that was based on, on good evidence and good research. So that's sort of a summation. I can't speak for everyone. I can only say that just from folks that I've seen from both sides of the aisle, and I want to stress that, from Democrats as well as Republicans, they don't see um, things changing anytime soon. Will we look at the penalty ranges for, for marijuana? I think we'll look at it, whether they'll change, I don't know. Um, but I don't see any major changes in the, in the well, future. You, you bring up several interesting points. One, I'd like to bookmark and perhaps come back to, to Bill on that, which is that where are we in terms of the scientific research? And that was one of the things that we had talked about. Are we in a position to where we have the opportunity to actually research the medical benefits of, of cannabis and an, and an ability to sort of understand what does it actually do, what are the effects, and, and how can they be helpful in these cases? And so I, but I might bookmark that because I think the other thing that you tapped into that's interesting, and I'll throw this open to the panel is that we are clearly having a national conversation about this issue and that national conversation is breaking along two lines it seems to me. One is the notion of medical marijuana and then one is the full-on notion of decriminalization, sort of the movement toward recreational, making marijuana available uh, recreationally. Are we in a position right now that we have had the opportunity for these states to have done that long enough to get information about how well is it working or not? What are the benefits for it? Are there un unintended consequences that we haven't seen? Or is the country sort of too new at this, at this to sort of have a sense that we might say, if we went down this path, this is something that might happen in Texas, or perhaps there's a warning out there for maybe perhaps why Texas wouldn't want to do that? I'd like to open that up to the panel for whoever wants. Well, I've Dave, talked to veterans in other states, and um, there's 22 medical marijuana states right now. And of those 22 states, 10 of those states, PTSD is a qualifying condition. And uh, I talk to veterans every week now, not just in Texas, but in these states with medical marijuana. And, and in the states that control it well, um, it's working perfectly. Uh, there's a dispensary. And the veteran goes and gets the uh, prescription from the doctor. 
and then the veteran goes to the dispensary and instead of buying his uh, his marijuana from the bandito motorcycle club uh, he's buying his uh, his marijuana from a person that has 20 different strains of marijuana there with different effects and so the the veteran can match the strain of marijuana as dr shaw talked about to his or her symptoms uh, and it and it's very controlled and in some of these states um, the veteran can grow up to say six plants of his own in his backyard and so if i can grow my own medicine in my backyard um, the pharmaceutical companies uh, would prefer that I not do that. They would prefer that I get my drugs from the VA. Uh, and so it can be controlled, and Colorado, I think, is the perfect model uh, for how medical cannabis can be controlled. And, uh, of course, it's outside the scope of what we're talking about now, but if you look at, at, at Colorado's medical marijuana program, it's a very good program, and the government controls it. Um, when I retired from the Army, I did, I did the Troops to Teachers program, and now I teach high school uh, at, in Killeen. And uh, what I would like to tell everyone, uh, we don't, we don't want to admit this, but I'm telling you right now, marijuana is all over every high school in Texas. Any teenager in Texas who wants to smoke marijuana can get marijuana more easy than getting alcohol. And it's because in Texas, the government controls alcohol. And it makes it a lot harder for teenagers to get hold of alcohol. But it's not hard at all to get marijuana for teenagers. At my high school, we struggle against this all day long, every day. And the reason is because the criminal organizations that control marijuana in Texas they don't ask the kid for his ID before they sell him a bag of marijuana. They don't care. They only care about making money. But if we take marijuana out of the hands of organized crime and put it into the hands of the state government, then the state government can control growing and distribution and selling of marijuana, and that makes it much more difficult for the teenagers to get hold of it. I, 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 want, I want to emphasize this. The drug war is not keeping our high school students from getting marijuana. It's all over my school. Kids get arrested routinely at my school for selling marijuana, for using marijuana. They come to my class high on marijuana. The, the kids have access to it. If they want it, they can get it. Senator, do you believe that if that, if that was a, st a step that the state took, that it could be better controlled and actually be safer, or is that a, a counterintuitive argument, do you think? Well, I, I don't see the state of Texas getting into the business of growing, regulating marijuana, no. I just, I, I don't see it now. Again, society is moving, it's changing. I just see the way I look at Texas. I mean, there's still counties in Texas that are dry, that don't allow alcohol. There's the Heights right here, not far from where we are now, doesn't allow alcohol. I can't see us as a state, um, you know, passing a law at this point telling our citizens that, you know, marijuana is legal and you right. can grow it and we're going to regulate and we're going to tax it and we're going to, um, you know, decide who can distribute it and, you know, what the packages have to look like and they have to have a state, a Texas seal of approval. I, I don't, do not think we're there yet. Uh, let's back up to the research question, because, Bill, this is something that we had talked about as we were working on the story, which is... <clears throat> As I had read the first draft and we were talking about it, and you know that's one of the wonderful things of working at the magazine is having the opportunity to spend time with a writer. You see the draft of the story, you read it carefully, you ask questions, you learn a lot of things that you don't know that you turn to the writer to help explain to you, and you try to become engaged seriously and thoughtfully on that topic in an effort to then share it with the readers of the magazine, hopefully that they become smarter or more thoughtful or better informed on the topic. And one of the things, Bill, that I had asked you was, <clears throat> What is the actual science behind what marijuana, in this case we were talking about it from a medical standpoint, right? This was not about recreational use, this was specifically targeted toward the treatment of PTSD. What are we learning from a scientific standpoint about how it actually works 
what it does and what the long-term efficacies of that treatment were. And I was surprised a little bit about the answer that you had told me about what research is available to us. And I wonder, could you just speak a little bit about that topic? Well, Dr. Shaw has talked about some of it, and Israel has, has been a, 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 a pioneer in that. Uh, Dr. Rafael Machulam was the first doctor to isolate THC and then went on really to, to, to study with his colleagues to understand the endocannabinoid system. So a lot of the research has come from there. Other research has been one of the prime, we don't have enough research, that's Well, that, that's, that, and that's my point, actually. Yes. I mean, my point is that the irony is that there aren't enough, as you say in the story, that there aren't enough outlets to study the drug in part because of the way the federal government is, is limiting it. Is that, is that right. correct to say? The only, the only way you, if you get, to get a grant to study marijuana, first of all, you pretty much have to, well, the only pot you can use legally is grown at, Ole, at a farm at Ole Miss and they decide what the, what the strength is. And they are not very anxious to share their stash with anybody who does not want to, to prove that marijuana is bad. In fact, the, the national, it, this is under the, the gatekeeper, is the National Institute for Drug Abuse, or on drug abuse, and the F, F, FHA and uh, FDA. And the DEA is also involved there in, in scheduling drugs. They have been extremely resistant to giving that, giving access to that marijuana to study, if unless there, there people say, "I promise you, we'll come out ag against right. this." And um, one, a, a spokes, and I quoted this in the article. If you've read the article, where a spokesperson said, "We are, we are not interested in, we are studying drug abuse. We are not interested in studying, uh, investigating the therapeutic benefits of cannabis." So there is a, a closed, a closed mind on that. Um, the, there is some evidence that, the, that NIDA is, is willing to open up on that. A study is now has been approved. At, I think there's a state senator who is stopping it but in Arizona. Mm -hmm. But it will get through to, to study uh, marijuana and PTSD uh, specifically. New Mexico has a pretty rigid, which is closer to what you're describing, is a pretty tight um, medical marijuana system. And they were the first state to, to allow the study, I mean, to allow PTSD as a, as a as qualifying condition. And uh, a study came out just in, in May in the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs, and I don't think you mentioned that. You know it. I, I, know I have it right here. <laughs> that uh, what they, they were, st were able to study with, with, the, with the marijuana they had. And if I'm not mistaken, that, they've, um, that on average, the symptoms, 70, they had a 75% reduction in the cap score, in the, in the cap score, in, in the, the, the major the three different categories that they were looking at. So some more and more research is being done. There is a limit. You say, well, why doesn't the government, well, the government actually doesn't study the drugs. The, the government allows it to be right. studied. The government right. can give, can give uh, money for it to be studied. Not many big pharmaceutical st companies want to study a drug and say, well, it proves it's safe. Now we're going, to, we're going to make a drug that does just what marijuana does, and we're going to charge you a lot for it. You could, of course, grow it yourself. So pharmaceutical companies are not interested in, in showing the benefits. It's, they may not be against it or whatever. Uh, GW Pharmaceuticals, which was the company, British company, that uh, was covered in the Sanjay Gupta's um, uh, CNN special, which they have taken the whole plant and really juiced it up, made it into a, an oil, and mixed it with a spray. And, and what that particular study was showing, or that particular special, showed that it has enormous benefits in reducing, greatly reducing, and sometimes eliminating seizures from epilepsy and Dravet syndrome, particularly. Now, people are with, with those, one little girl who was featured there, an extreme case, of course, but down from 300 seizures a day to three, and very quickly by, by using this. And so children with, um, uh, um, parents with children with, with Dravet syndrome or epilepsy with lots of seizures are moving to Colorado to have access to that. I think it's the case that about 40% of the users of the medical marijuana system in New Mexico are veterans who have moved to Mex New Mexico right. to, to, to have access to that. And, um, one of the persons that I talked to about that said, they are, they are not moving there just to get pot. You can get pot. They said, it's very, they, want to, they want to obey the law, 
and they, it's pretty strict re uh, requirements for them to get into that. They said it would, there, it would be a lot easier for them to go ahead and get it off the, uh, off the illegal market than to try to game the system. Mm -hmm. So there's the, the, the government has not shown interest in allowing the research. There are a great many large bureaucracies and institutions that benefit from keeping marijuana illegal. Mm -hmm. And that, I, I can't tell you what percentage, what portion that plays, but it plays a lot. Uh, I want yeah. to also address that point. And I, I, you know, I agree with most everything, but I, I think given, for what we're asking, which is, you know, should we have this program in our state? You know, is this beneficial enough to at least open the door to the severest patients, you know, who are pretty much committing suicide, you know, by the hundreds every day from not just PTSD, but also chronic pain um, and other kind of end stage debil debilitating disorders where they've gone through the entire gamut and then some, you know, for, the, for these most desperate patients. I really would like to advocate that we have some sort of basic program in 2015. Honestly, this is, this is a medicinal herb that's been used for thousands of years in countries all around the world. I think just having the debate itself is, is maybe, I mean, it, it's necessary, but the, I feel like the questions have been answered, you know, both from just, if you look at the science that's present today, um, you know, I, I gave the uh, testimony and I, I focused mostly on chronic pain, but I was able to pull up 25, 30 solid papers that were published in American journals. Um, several of them were authored by the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research, and that was a government-funded um, organization in California that was a nonprofit between UC San Diego and UCSF, and I think they must have published at least 20 reputable studies um, and they had, you know, quite a good budget and doses, and it followed NIH protocol, you know, the entire way. Um, just for PTSD, you know, I have 15 or 20 probably, you know, solid articles that we could discuss. It's only a two-hour program, and this isn't medical school, so I didn't want to bore you with all that. But, you know, we have data from New Mexico. Um, and, and Dr. Martin mentioned that from their program. Also in Arizona recently, it just got approved. And honestly, I was a little disappointed because the director of public health there, Will Humble, um, who oversees the program, and that's a very tight program in a conservative state. Um, so for, they have about 12 or 13 conditions that you have to have, and you have to have a doctor's documentation and a second visit with a physician to actually get on the registry. So it's a very strict state and it's tightly controlled. And um, they had to actually go through the legal system. And recently, last month, an administrative law judge ruled that PTSD must be included as one of the conditions because of the overwhelming amount of scientific evidence. And so I think this point that's come up that there's not enough science or not enough evidence or, you know, it's still smoke and mirrors, that's not true. They actually know the mechanism. They know where the cannabis is acting in the hippocampus, in the, in the amygdala, in the limbic system. They know the type of receptors it binds to, the downstream effects, which neurotransmitters are upregulated and downregulated. And overall, you know, I mean, there are, there are endocannabinoid receptors in almost every organ in your body and also in the immune system. And the main goal of cannabis is to maintain equilibrium or homeostasis within the body. So if you're two in one direction or the other, um, it brings you to the middle. And that's where, you know, some, and that's why I used to be against this because I used to think, you know, how can one thing treat 15 to 20 diseases? I mean, this has got to be placebo. But I think after reading all this science, it's very hard um, to think that, that there's not enough of it. Of course, there needs to be better quality studies. We need gold standard trial, um, randomized placebo control, double blind studies. But in order to do that, um, it can't be in Schedule One. We're going to have to have federal government, um, you know, change laws before we can get the type of studies that we really you know, that are robust and, and definitive. But in the meantime, um, you know, every day that we, that we waste arguing about this, again, you know, how many veterans are, are, are dying? How many patients, you know, with end-stage diseases are either suffering unnecessarily, um, you know, from, from symptoms that probably could be helped by this, this plant? Or, uh, you know, it's just, I, I feel like the delay is, uh, 
you know, it's, it's something that we can that we can do something about, um, but it's it's going to have to come from advocacy and panels like this, and ultimately, hopefully, you know, the law is changing um, in the upcoming year. Yeah, and I want to be be clear that within one year of me using high grade cannabis, I stopped taking psychotropic drugs, and I haven't taken any since. And my pain meds. Uh, for years now has been like 10% of what I was taking at that time. And I don't abuse alcohol anymore. And that's because of cannabis. And every veteran tells the exact same story. Every veteran. And, uh, and so I thought it was just me. Um, and that's why I got involved with Texas Normal uh, is because I wanted to spread the message. And then once I got involved in Texas Normal and started meeting veterans all over the state, and now I, I have a whole network of veterans, every veteran tells the exact same story. Uh, and we don't want to be criminals. I do not want to be a criminal in the state of Texas. I'm a, I'm a peaceful, law-abiding person. And, and so we need to change the law so that I'm not a criminal. I just would say I think the debate gets muddled a bit when if we want to talk a specific issue, veterans and post-traumatic stress syndrome, I think that's something we can talk about. What, what I think creates the issues and take, makes things take a long time is when we bring in the argument of um, looking at all of our drug policy and really you know, trying to do something with a broad sweep. I, that's, I think, where you're going to run into your biggest obstacles at, at the legislature. Um, I think if you focus on something like the veterans and you do have the research and you have the testimony and the witnesses and the firsthand accounts and, and scientific evidence, then I think you have a real chance of, of moving, um, moving the ball. But otherwise, I think if we try to, uh, you know, a, a, attack this from too, on too big of a battlefield where you start talking about, because if we want to talk about the benefits of marijuana, then I think it's only fair that we talk about the bad sure. Sure. side effects of marijuana, what it does to society, to, to kids, to people looking for jobs. I mean, I was a prosecutor for years and a criminal district court judge. So for all the stories about all the good stuff that marijuana has done, I could tell you a lot of stories about how it's ruined lives. And I'm not here to argue that point. It's just that's part <clears throat> of the narrative. Right. And if we get into that subject, then probably our veterans aren't going to get what they need. Right. That's right. So it, we need to, in my opinion, if you want to do something for the veterans, then focus on that and do it in a wise way, in an informed way, and you know, there's a good chance there could be some progress made. That's, that's just my opinion. In the legislature, politicians may be more comfortable looking at something if it, again, was sort of narrowly focused on yes. that particular issue. I, I think, think so. That, I think that I, I, would, I would personally, I talked last week with two women who were part of the Mothers, mothers Advocating Medical Marijuana for Autism and are finding that, that this is having positive effects with children. I think there are other, I perfectly agree with you that the California system particularly went way too far when you go, you know, doctor, boop, boop. Uh, whether it had terrible bad benefits, it was not a closely run system. The New Mexico system is, is much more carefully run and, and has, is less likely for, to have abuse. Uh, personally, uh, I, I also agree that Texas is not likely to become the, the marijuana producer, seller, and dis the distributor and seller. Uh, it already has one vice in the, the lottery. Um, should, but that depends. Only one, huh? <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's one. Uh, prisons are another. But, uh, but um, there, and, and I think the, the Colorado system, which is the, the all-out commercial system, is probably the, the legalization form that's likely to cause the most abuse, has likely to have the, the most kinds of problems. I would personally want a, a, a much more cautious approach to that, and certainly things like packaging edibles in, in attractive ways so that kids get them and things like that. That was, that was really, I, I'm, I think that was really poorly, right. really poorly right. thought out. Right. There are ways that, many ways it can do be, be, besides talking about just this or way out here, but we, need, we do need to keep having that, uh, that conversation. 
Uh, we're coming up on the end of our time here. Uh, there are microphones in the aisles on the side that if you're interested in asking questions of any of the panelists, I encourage you uh, to please feel free to do so. We're setting some time aside to do that. You're welcome to address them to the panel as a whole or any of the specific members. I would like to say, though, and perhaps to end on it, uh, Major Bass, we're grateful for you sharing your story, and I, I think I've appreciated the thoughtfulness of the conversation that, that we have had. One thing I'd like to ask you, though, is you have said that um, the, the positive effects that it has had on, on your life and that you're now teaching uh, and that many of the, 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 the worst symptoms, it seems, hopefully are behind you. Is that something that you were doing as you, as you came to that in consultation with your doctors at the VA or as you were beginning to ramp down and you, you said you're down to 10 percent, say, of those, those previous meds? Was that, uh, how did you come to that path and, and what is your expectation for going forward? Do you have a sense that this will be part of your life going forward as treatment or do you think that there is potentially a way, a cure is too big of a word, I think, but in terms of your daily life, I'm just sort of curious as to how you see things going forward for you now, not only in your routine, but also just in your, in your private life. A veteran in Texas cannot go to a, a VA clinic or hospital and say, hey, I use marijuana, it's working really good for me, uh, because a lot of the VA doctors will immediately uh, cut that veteran off from any uh, psychotropic drugs or pain meds and try to force that veteran to enroll in a drug abuse program and, and admit that he's a drug abuser. Uh, and then uh, when he successfully completes the drug abuse program, then they'll say, okay, here's your pain meds and psychotropics back, good luck. Uh, that doesn't make any sense uh, because the, the problem is that, that we become addicted to the pharmaceutical drugs that the VA doctors are giving us in the first place and cannabis is the exit drug. Uh, but in the 22 states with medical marijuana, this is uh, VA Directive 2011-004, uh, published in Jan on January 31st, 2011. And in the 22 states with medical marijuana, a veteran can present himself to the, to the VA doctor and say, this is my legal prescription to marijuana. And the doctor, instead of treating that veteran like a drug abuser, will, and this is what the directive says, the doctor will merely make a notation in the electronic record of the veteran saying this, this is a non-VA prescription that this uh, veteran is legally taking, and then just continue to treat the veteran as normal. I've talked to numerous veterans uh, in Texas who have been kicked out of the VA system because they either admitted that they used marijuana or they came up positive on a urinalysis at a VA clinic or hospital for, for marijuana. And so you have this, uh, this uh, situation where in 22 states, the federal government says, oh, you have a legal prescription to marijuana, that's okay, no problem. And then in the other states, including Texas, you go to a VA clinic and they say, oh, you're a drug abuser. Uh, we're not gonna give you any more meds and you need to enroll in this drug abuse program. And so the federal government has like this split personality on marijuana. Uh, and so the bottom line is, I could not talk about marijuana with my VA doctors, uh, and I can't to this day. And so it has to be a secret thing, and you have to lie to the VA doctor, and you have to lie on the forms, and you have to try to make sure that you don't take a urinalysis so they detect the THC. And, uh, and, 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 and in my opinion, that's horrible uh, because it's, it's allowed me to, to lead a normal, healthy lifestyle, cannabis has, uh, but, but I have to live like a criminal, and, and I can't even discuss it with a doctor, and, and that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and so I'm, I'm basically managing my own health care, but I would prefer to do it with a doctor. And, uh, and no, I'm not going to stop using cannabis because cannabis uh, allows me to live a normal life uh, and, and it treats the chronic pain and the symptoms of PTSD. But I would prefer to do it uh, legally uh, under the auspices of the Texas government and uh, with a doctor overseeing my care.